Acts chapter 27 is about a shipwreck. About some men that got in a storm, a bunch of prisoners. Paul was on this ship and was on his way to Rome to be tried. Let's start reading in verse number 9. I'm going to read some of this. And I have to read some to get you to get the gist of this story. So I'm going to try to read kind of quickly. But we're not on a time schedule here. Let's read a little bit of this and I'll talk to you about it, okay? Look at verse number 9. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt and much damage, not only of the lading in ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in the more part, part advised to depart thence also, if by any means, they might attain to Phoenix, and there to winter, which is in a haven of Crete, and lie toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, suppose that they might obtain their purpose, loosened thence, they sailed close to Crete, by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurycladon, Eurycladon, and when the ship was caught, it could not bear up into the wind. We let her drive. That's why I let my wife drive when we go on trips, because it's scriptural. Just let her drive. You don't have to worry about her telling you how to drive. Just let her do it. Just sit around and relax. Let her drive. Amen. And running. She said, that's why I ought to make the coffee, too, because the Bible says Hebrews. <laughs> Hebrews. But anyway. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat, and when, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, straight sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. You can see their troubles are getting worse, and it's getting progressively worse. And if you'll remember back here in verse... Number nine, Paul told them not to go on this voyage, but they wouldn't listen. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. I know that feeling, don't you? You ever had that feeling? Yeah. Hopeless. Just hopeless. But after long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me, how be it we must cast upon a certain island." But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then, fearing that we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For thou shalt not in hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were all in, in the ship, two hundred three score and sixteen souls. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out of the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded, if it were possible, to thrust in the ship. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea loosed the rudder bands, hoist up the mainsail of the wind, and made toward the shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves, and the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, 
lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they should, they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to the land, and the rest some on board and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Now we read a lot of scripture this morning, more than we normally do. Normally I just read a, two or three verses and preach. But I want you to get the whole story that happened here. They were on this voyage, a whole bunch of prisoners. We read there how many of them they were. And a bunch of men on this boat. They had all kinds of trouble. And they got in the middle of a, of a life-threatening storm. And, and almost every one of them could have died. They lost the ship. The ship went down. They could have all died. I'll preach to you this morning what to do in the midst of a storm. And you've heard a lot of messages about storms, and, and you've heard me preach on them. You've heard a lot of preachers preach at one time or another on being in storms. Everybody has to go through storms, storms of life. Everybody has them. Sooner or later, you're going to go through storms. Job said, man is born of a few days, is but a, uh, man is born of a woman is but a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow, continueth not. Jacob told Pharaoh when they met there toward the end of the book of Genesis, when Pharaoh's asking Jacob, Jacob's getting old and he'd been reunited with Joseph and all that. Listen to what Jacob said. It's a strange thing to say. Jacob said, few and evil have the days and the years of my life been. What a statement to make, Jacob said. Now, Jacob's days hadn't been evil, but that was the way he viewed his life. After all those years of blessing and good things, but Jacob had been a trickster and he had deceived a lot of people over the years, but he, he had lived the ripe old age and he had been rich, wealthy, and had everything everybody could want. But a lot of bad things had happened over those last few years. A lot of heartache and a lot of depression. A lot of, his heart had been broken. And he said, he said, it'd been, he said the years, they'd been few and been evil. Jacob had been through the storm of his life. And uh, troubles, unfortunately, are a way of life. The, ch- the choir just got through singing that song a few minutes ago. It was in that song they sung, Till the Storm Passes By. Everybody's going to go through storms. I don't, you know, I, I'm not up here saying, be like me. I like storms. I'm not a fool. I'm not an idiot. I don't like storms. I, I don't like them. I, I dread seeing them coming. Uh, you know, I, I'm the type of person when a storm comes up, I don't run up out of the house like a scared chicken, but... But I also not one of them people that gets in a car and chases a tornado with a camera and runs up in the middle of it either. Come on, like that's crazy. We was laughing the other day. I've probably told this before, but when we was kids and a storm had come up, we'd all go jump in the bed. Because, you know, Mama had a feather bed. And we always thought if you get up in the bed where the, where the pillows was at and the bed was at, lightning couldn't strike you because lightning didn't strike feathers. We was always taught that because you never see lightning strike a chicken. Chickens... <laughs> Jacob's head gets struck by lightning. That's what they tell us. Get up in the bed. Lightning don't strike people's in the bed. We don't jump up in the middle of Mama's bed. It's a feather bed. And then we say, Mama, are you sure? She said, well, have you ever seen a chicken get struck by lightning? No. Well, there you go. And we believed it. I guess that's our way of just getting us all in the bed. And we believe it and just be still till the storm passed. But ain't it crazy what kids will believe? Go crawl up in the bed. Chickens don't get struck by lightning. That's one of them things where he said, how does an elephant, uh, how do you hide an elephant? You put red tennis shoes on him and he climbs up the cherry tree. You ever seen an elephant up the cherry tree? It works, don't it? See? I mean, really. I mean, it's that kind of stuff people just believe. But I'm telling you this morning, the storm, you get in these storms sometimes and we have to go through them and sometimes it seems like these people are in this storm. Listen, when you're in a ship, and you're with a bunch of men, you're out on the ocean, and, it's, and, and there's a storm and there's no end in sight, and it looks like the end of your life. There's some things in this story that I believe me and you can learn from that, uh, uh, spiritually speaking, listen, kids, you're going to go through some storms that's unexpected. All the storms of life always come unexpected, and there are all, always things that you, do, that you don't prepare yourself for. Listen, some of you will get married, and you'll start a home, and there'll be something happen to you that you never dreamed would happen. I mean, listen, I don't, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. 
job. It could be a job, or or it could be something. It could be you could lose a job, or it could be something. It could be something real bad happen, or or it could be something. It could be a death in your family, or or God forbid, you could lose a you could lose a baby or something. I mean, it could happen. It's happened to people in here. Had it happen to them? I mean, it could happen. Anything can happen. Storms you go through, and you don't know how to handle it. But I'm telling you, in the midst, in the middle of that storm, as Paul and these men survived that storm, there's some lessons you can see in this story that'll help you to survive in the middle of that storm. Amen. Things are going to happen to you. Verse number 15, I already mentioned it a while ago. First thing I want you to notice. He said, we could not bear up into the wind. We just let her drive. Just let her drive. Sometimes the storm's too strong to resist. You can't steer it. You can't fight it. It's suicidal. You can't fight the storm. Sometimes you just have to. Sometimes you just have to ride it. You ever heard that? You ever heard that old saying? Just ride it out. Sometimes that's all you can do in a storm. Just ride it out. We used to call it this. We used to say, we said this, just hunker down. What are you going to do? We're going to get in the car and go somewhere it's safe. Sometimes you can't. We had a, a, a storm come up a while back. I mean, brother, I mean, like a tornado. Just They said a tornado's going to hit. I mean, right in your front door. The only thing we can do is just hunker down where we was at. We didn't have time to get in the car and go to work. Listen, brother, the Bible said in Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not let all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind, and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of His feet. we got to trust Him when we're in the midst of the storm. Sometimes the only thing you can do is just hunker down and ride it out. You say, preacher, how do I get out of this? Sometimes you can't get out of it. Sometimes you just got to ride the storm. Sometimes you just got to... You just to ride it out and see where it takes you. Sometimes that's all you can do, brother or sister. Noah rode the storm out. Hey, he rode it out for over a year with all those animals and his family stuck in that ark and he landed on the highest pinnacle on earth. Hey, sometimes that's all you can do is just ride it out. Amen. That's all they do. They just let her drive. That's all they could do. That first part of this storm, he said we let her drive. He said we couldn't handle the boat. I've seen the, I've seen them old movies. One of them, the captain of that ship's up there, and that, and that, uh, that ship's going crazy, and waves are coming everywhere, and that wheel, they're trying to control it, it's just spinning, and they can't even grab it. You can't do nothing when it's going like that. You just let her drive. Let the ship go where it's going to go. The storm is in control. Noah rode it out and put his family on the highest mountain in the world. And it was the only place that was dry when the storm was over. When that storm was over, Noah had the only place that was dry. Everybody else was floating. That's right. Because of the storm, he was the only person that had a fresh start. You think about that. You say, oh, this storm is awful. It's bad for it. You don't know what I'm going through. You'll never know. Maybe because of the storm, you're getting ready to have a brand new start. You ever said this before? Oh, I just wish I had. I wish I could just start over and have just have a fresh start. Maybe that's why you're going through the storm. Maybe God's getting ready to give you a brand new start. I mean, sometimes things are for a reason. They said one time, Thomas Edison came home and his house was on fire and it was burning to the ground and the fire department's putting it out doing their best they could and people was everywhere and he's just standing there watching. And they said, Mr. Edison, we're so sorry all this happened. He said, well, it's no big deal. He said, I've been waiting for a good opportunity to build a new laboratory. Burned to the ground. That's one way of looking at it. Brother, listen, sometimes the only thing you can do when you're in the midst of the uh, life's worst storm is just ride it out. Nothing you can do when you're laying on an operating table and they're getting ready to cut you open and you've got all the surgeons around you and the nurses and the doctors. You tell me what you're going to do. Nothing. Just write it out. Reach over and get the master of the sea by the hand and say, all right, Jesus, me and you are going to write it out together. What else are you going to do? You're out of control. You have no control anymore. You have no control you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Just write it out. Secondly, look at verse number 17. The Bible said they used helps. They used helps. The Bible said when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. Sometimes when we go, we go through storms, we, will, we want to look invincible, and we look like we got it under control, 
and uh, we don't need anybody. We can do this, and we we let pride get in our way. When what we should do is use those helps. You know something? You got helps available to you if you'd use them. Those things on that ship to help them with. They had helps on the ship. Did you know every vehicle that you go down the road in has got helps? Stuff there to help you with. It's got it's got emergency flashers, spare tire, a jack. It's got lights. It's got interior lights. It's got signal lights. It's got all that stuff to help you. If you'll use it. Amen? There's people, there's, some people are too hard-headed to get help. They'd rather wait till they're shipwrecked to ask for help. I've seen people, there, I've seen people in their lives get in a wreck and it's upside down and wrong side out. And I've seen their life explode into a million pieces before they come ask for help. And I feel like saying, why didn't you, why didn't you come to me a month ago? Why didn't you come talk to me two months ago? Why didn't you come see me six months ago before you got in this mess? I could have helped you then. You ever seen that happen? I could have helped you then. You're laying on the bottom of the ocean floor and you see a ship's upside down and then you come to the preacher. I can't help you now. You ever seen people who's got an unruly teenager, 12 years old, and in trouble, in trouble in school, in trouble with the neighbors, on drugs, parents can't do nothing with them, and the parents come and say, Preacher, what, can I, what should I do? I'm like, I don't know. I ain't got no suggestions for you. You should have started when they was nine months old before they started walking. When they started pitching them little hissy fits when they was in the crib, should have tanned their little hide, pulled their diaper down, and whipped them. You said, Preacher, that's too young. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. Hey, they got that Adamic nature in them when they're babies. They come forth from the womb speaking lies, the Bible said. Hey, man, we started ours when, the, I mean, by the time the doctor gives them the first spank, and you should follow what the doctor does. The doctor whips them the first time. The doctor knows more than most parents do. Hey, man. Hey, if you can potty train a dog at six weeks old not to use the bathroom in the house, you tell me you can't train a, a phone human that's three months old? Something wrong with you, Jack? Hey, Amen. I'm telling you, brother, the Bible said train them. It's a training process. I don't know who this is for, but take your medicine. The other people think that kids just come out trained automatic. No, they don't. You've got to train them according to the Bible. You've got to train them what no means and boundaries and consequences and all that stuff. We've got dogs at our house and there's certain things we let them do and certain things they can't do. And when they break, when we, they break them rules, there are consequences for it. We spank the dog, whip the dog like we do the kids. Tie them up and beat them. No, we don't do that. <laughs> Amen. You snap your finger at them and go, eh, eh, just like that. They do just like the kids do. You snap your finger at grown kids and do like that. I do that. To this day, I can somebody snap their finger and I do. I think my daddy come back from the grave. Is daddy here? Yeah. Daddy used to be preaching and do like that. Straighten up our boy. Oh God, he's going to beat me. I got off my message. Helps. They used helps. Why don't you use the helps the Lord's given you? Amen. Choose the helps wisely. The Lord's given you help by His, His Word and the Holy Spirit and the compassionate brethren and the people in the church. Listen, you girls, you girls, when you need help, you need to go to your mama and get help. And there's other ladies in the church that can help you. There's people around that can help you. You young boys, there's men in the church that can advise you and help you. Don't go to your friends. They can't help you. Hey, if you're 17 years old, don't go get other advice from another 17-year-old. My goodness gracious, alive. If I was 17 years old, I wanted advice about work or relationship or, back or girls. I wouldn't go to another pimple face 17-year-old. I'd go to a man that's 40 years old and been married and knew about women. I'd say, what do you think about her? And if he said, leave her alone, I'd say, got you. Wouldn't you? Every man in here agrees with that statement. Unless you're a teenager and you just want to do your own thing. Amen? That's right. If I were to go to California, I'd go to somebody that's been to California and say, that's the best way to get out there. I wouldn't go to somebody I'd never been. They used helps. Number three, look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. They lightened the ship. Verse 18 and 19 said, Being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. 
And they, they cast out their own hands the tackling of the ship. They lighten the ship. They lighten, you'll have to lighten your load to stay right with God. You'll have to lighten your load by taking it to the Lord and leaving it there. The Bible said in the book of Hebrews, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Reason some people is having shipwrecked and they're having trouble in the storm. They need to lighten their load. And they're going to have to lighten some of the storms is never going to settle and you lighten some of the sin in your life. Some people ain't never going to get right with God. Things ain't never going to straighten out. Things ain't never going to get right until you get some things out of your life. you got things in your ship that's causing your ship to get off course. You're never going to get right. That's the reason your ship's getting off course causing you to crash. I know, I know this kind of preaching ain't real popular. People don't shout and scream and holler and wave their hands. But I'm telling you, if you've got sin in your life, there's things on that boat that's going to cause that ship to keep veering off course and veering off course. And, it's, and you know what it is. You know. I don't have to get up here and point it out. You know what it is. Holy Spirit's on, on board that boat. He's telling you. When they got in that storm, so I didn't have to peck them on the head and say, here's what it is. They ran over and started grabbing it and throwing it overboard. You start getting in trouble, you know what to get rid of. You know what to get rid of. You get in real serious trouble and you start crashing and you start burning to the ground, I guarantee you, you'll get on an old-fashioned altar and you'll start begging and pleading and crying and you'll say, Oh God, I know what's wrong in my life. I know what it is. You won't come up and say, Oh God, if there's anything in my life. Oh no. You won't say, If there's anything. You'll say, Oh God, it's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. I've got to get this stuff out of my life. I know it's causing me trouble. When you really, really, I mean really want to get right with God, you'll start getting that sin out of your life. You'll lighten your load. When your ship starts sinking, when you dive off of something and you're swimming, if I dove off a diving board this morning, I can swim pretty good. All my family can swim except Debbie. I've tried to get her let me teach her how to swim. She don't trust me. But I guarantee if I dove off somewhere this morning swimming, First thing I have to start doing is taking my cowboy boots off. Because they'd start waking me down. They'd fill up the water. And I'd have to pull off my shirt. And I'd pull off my necktie. You know what I'm saying? Certain things will weigh you down. I'd pull out my, I'd pull out my car keys and my wallet because it's leather and full of $100 bills. Full. $1,000 bills. You know that ain't true. I'm a Baptist preacher. Silver and gold have I none. But ser- seriously... If you was going to jump off when we were up there at camp and we jump off that dock, first thing I'd start doing is checking my pocket. I take everything off. I take it, not everything. I leave my shorts and my shirt on. Make sure there ain't no keys in my pocket. Take my glasses off and everything. And dive in that water. I don't want to be nothing waking me down. I mean, I can swim pretty good, but not that good. I don't want to dive off and have a gold chain around my neck and have that thing pull me down the bottom. Then people win those Olympics and win the gold medal. They don't jump in there and swim with that around their neck. And people even shave their body. Shave all that stuff off and shame. Shave their hairy chest and their legs and all that stuff and dive in there and swim around. That's a little weird, ain't it? Men shaving their body is weird to me. Weird. See them commercials with them guys are shaving their arms and shaving their, shaving their chest and their back. Something weird about a man shaving himself. A little weird. A little weird to me. I'm not saying he's coming out of the closet, but he might be looking for the doorknob. <laughs> it's just odd to me now. If you know somebody does that, I ain't saying he's gay, but it is strange. It's weird. <laughs> number four, look at verse 21. Verse number 21, heeding the warnings could have avoided a lot of harm. After long abstinence, Paul stood forth and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Christ and have gained this harm and loss. Because back in verse number 10 and 11, he warned them. He warned them. He said, I perceive this voyage will be with much hurt and much damage. A lot of times, people get in storms of their own doing. A lot of times, 1 Timothy 4.16 said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing so, this shall save both save thyself and them to hear thee. 
A lot of times people go off into storms because they're hard-headed and won't listen. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I've done that. I've got, I've got myself, when I was a young teenager, I wouldn't listen. And I got, it, got myself in stuff on my own hard-headedness and went straight none. Now listen, I'm telling you, I'm trying to preach to you. This is what real preaching is, is telling you the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. You young people there this morning might not like what I'm saying, but someday you'll get it and you'll say, you know what, he told me the truth. You think you know what's right, you think you know what you want, but everything you want ain't right. Everything you want, everything that shines ain't silver and gold. Amen. Heeding the warnings could have avoided. If they had listened to Paul, they wouldn't have lost that ship and had that shipwreck and ended up on that barbarous island in chapter number 28 and all that other stuff happened and caused shipwreck and everything else. They'd have just listened to a little bit of preaching. Wouldn't it be nice if people just listen to preaching and say, you know what, I'm going to do what Brother Ronnie said because he, he said that the Bible teaches we shouldn't do that so I'm going to stay away from it. Can I tell you something this morning? I could tell you people's names. I could give you a list of people that wouldn't listen. That lives are in a wreck. They're shipwrecked, most of them permanently. And they're on a desert island now. Just wouldn't listen. If they'd have just heeded the warnings. Number four. Look at verse 23. Number 23. Realize that you're not forsaken. For there stood by me this night an angel of God whose who's I am, whom I serve. Realize that you're not forsaken. Just because you're in the middle of a storm don't mean Jesus said, I'll never leave thee and I'll never forsake thee. Remember this. You've heard this statement. You've heard me say it. No ship has ever sank with Jesus on board. Psalm 19, it said, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. If you'll trust in the Lord, your ship ain't going to go down. Somehow, me and my wife has talked to each other before about some of the storms we've gone through. And we, we've talked to each other and we've said, what do you, what, how do you think this is going to turn out? What are we going to do? And one of us will tell the other one, I don't know, but somehow things always have worked out in the past. Now, you don't say that when you're, when you're young and you've just been married a year. But after you've been married as long as we have and been through umpteen storms, you look back over all them other storms and you say, well, we've been through all them storms and somehow something works out. I don't know. I don't know how he's going to do it this time. But, but somehow things work out. Life experiences teaches you just to hang on and trust Him. And that's what gives you the ability to, to preach it and believe it. And that's why you should use those helps to older people like us us older folks in the church and go to them and say, how am I going to make it through this? And we'll help you because we've been through it. Amen. You're, not, you're not forsaken. You're not forsaken. No ship ever went down with Jesus on board. Number five, look at verse 29. Anchor deep and keep your faith and courage. Look at verse 29. Verse 29 said, They fear that we should be fallen on the rocks. They cast four anchors out of the stern. They cast four anchors out of the stern and wish for day. Let me give you four anchors real quick. One anchor is the sanctuary. When you're in a storm, don't forget the sanctuary. Psalm 77, 13, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God. Just keep coming to church. Keep coming to church. When you're in the midst of the storm and you don't know how it's going to turn out and your life's upside down, just keep coming to church. Some way, somehow. Everybody here will raise your hand, I guarantee you. says, Preacher, I've been in a storm of my life before. And I thought it was the end, but I just kept going to church. In some way, somehow, God pulled me through it. How many would agree with that statement? Raise your hand. Everybody in this church. Not only that, but the saints. Galatians 6, 2 said, Bear you one of those burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. That's another anchor. When you're in the storm of your life, don't crawl up somewhere and get by yourself. Talk to one of the saints. Bear one of those burdens. It, it, won't, hurt. it won't hurt another Christian to call them or go to them and say, Look, Listen, Facebook is full of people knowing each other's business. Go to a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ and say, Look, man, I'm going through something right now and I just need you to pray for me. I just need you. You don't have to, you don't have to spill your guts all over town. I'm talking about, I'm talking about confidence in, in one brother or one sister and say, Please pray for me. Pray for my family. I'm going through the ringer right now. I'm in a storm. I feel like I'm going under. 
Just share a burden. That's one of those anchors. The Scriptures, Psalm 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the man that trusteth in Him. We've been reading through the book of Isaiah in the last couple of weeks. Me and Daddy was talking the other day. I said, man, that's some of the most wonderful Scripture. Most of it's dealing with the, with the millennium and the return of Christ when He comes back and judges the world and, and returns uh, the Jewish people to their homeland. And that's some of the best reading in the, in, in the Bible. It's just wonderful. And how good it is and how sweet it is to the taste, to the spiritual man. And Job said, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed these words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Don't forsake His Word. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Preacher, it ain't doing me any good. It is doing you good. It is doing you good. Listen, nourishment's nourishment. I don't care if it's a ribeye steak or a bologna sandwich. Amen? You say, Preacher, it just don't seem to be doing me good. When you eat something, it's helping you. It don't matter if it's a peanut butter and cracker or if it's a corn dog. It's helping you. Getting something in your system. Fourthly is the spoken word. The preaching of the cross of them that perish is foolishness. But unto us that are saved is the power of God. Don't forget preaching. Listen, don't, don't let just the only time you come to church be the only preaching you ever hear. Listen to preaching. Get some preaching CDs and take them home with you. Listen to preaching at home. Listen to preaching in your car. I was listening to preaching last night going home from here. On my way back to church this morning, I love preaching. I go on trips. I take preaching CDs and listen to other men preach. I'm talking about good King James Bible preaching preachers. I want to I want to nourish my inner man with some good Bible preaching. Listen, don't just wait just once a week and listen to preaching. And if you don't come to church very often, then you're not getting fed much. That's one of the anchors. Number six. Look at verse thirty. And the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they let down the boat of the sea. And they would cast out the anchors. And Paul said, verse 31, Except these abide in the ship, you will not be saved. They remained in the ship. Don't jump ship. Just don't jump ship. Just hang in there. That's one of the... That's one of the... That's one of the things that people do. One of the most common things that people do when they're in a storm. Think about that a minute. If you saw somebody in a ship in the natural world and they were in a storm and they all started jumping out. Would that make sense? Usually they go down with the ship. They go down with the ship or wait for a rescue boat or a helicopter to come get them. But to start jumping out. You ever notice when people get in a storm and they get depressed, they get discouraged or they get hurt, they get hurt at church, they jump ship. They get out of church. They quit. They quit. I've been, I've been in this since I was 20 years old. Brother Shannon, and I've, seen, I've seen people get hurt, get discouraged, or lose interest, whatever you want to call it. And they jump ship. Just jump ship. Don't jump ship. Paul said this. He said, except you abide in the ship, you've got to stay with the ship. Amen. The only time, they, only time they got that they abandoned the ship was when the ship went down and busted into a million pieces. And then, then they all they all start swimming to the shore, and even then they didn't until they run it aground. It was a safe time to get out of the boat. Verse forty four said they committed themselves to the sea. Uh, they committed themselves to the sea. Verse forty through forty four. That's when they fell into that place where two seas met. And they all jumped out, started swimming to shore when it's safe, and some on pieces of boards and broken pieces of the ship. They committed themselves to the sea. Here's my last point I want to make. Commit yourself to the sea. In other words, make a commitment just to stay with it. Just I'm in a storm. I'm in a storm. Just make a commitment. You know, Commitment's the only way you're going to get anywhere in life. Whether it's on your job or your marriage or church work or anything. You know how many times I've thought about quitting the ministry? I can't count them. Every preacher, if you'll be honest, in the ministry has thought about it a jillion times. You know how much a jillion is? Tell them. A bunch. Everybody's thought about that. Everybody's thought about it. But you can't You can't quit. That's human nature. It's human nature to think about just bailing out. 
But if you bail out, you know what? You go get in something else and you get aggravated in that, then you'll want to quit that too. You can't quit everything in life because there's aggravation and there's problems and there's people and there's heartache, heartbreak and everything you do in life. There's no party in everything you do. Every, every walk of life, you're going to have heartaches and misery and problems. So you might as well just make up your mind whatever God called you to do, whatever work you're in or whatever you're doing, your marriage, whatever, just make a commitment. I'm sticking it out. I'm going to stick with it. This is what God's called me to do, so I'm going to stay with it. I've been doing this since I was 20 years old. I might as well stay with it. I'm too old to take up a new career. What am I going to do? Be an astronaut? Amen? Really? Just make a commitment. I, God saved me. And I mean, think about if you if you don't stay with it, if you don't stay with it, if you bail out in the storm, if it gets bad and you jump ship and you get out, what are you going to tell your kids? What are you going to tell your kids when they get a little bit older and they start really getting in trouble? Junior, won't you come to church? Me and your mama got back to church. Won't you come to church with us? And I think that'd be the best thing for you. Leave that old girl alone, and you need to get off them, get off them drugs, and quit drinking. What, what are you going to do when Junior says, "Well, Daddy, y'all quit. Y'all quit that time when so and so happened. You ain't gonna stay. You quit. You have a lot better chance with Junior if you stay with it. And you never quit, and you never let up. You keep the hammer down." Heaven bow with a hammer down, you never let up. You have a lot better chance with your son or your daughter if you say, Why don't you come on back to church with us? And he sees that you've never let up and you've never quit and you've never you've had a commitment all your life. You have a better chance with him, with your grandkids or your kids, if they look at your life and say, You know what? Daddy's never quit church and mama's never quit. Maybe that is maybe that is the answer. That's that's how I got back in church. My mom and daddy never missed a beat. But mom and daddy been in and out and in and out. I might not have ever got saved. When my daddy got hurt that time in that church stuff that I told y'all about, and he left that church, he was hurt so bad, and he walked the floors at night and cried. If he had quit preaching then, I got saved not long after that, a couple of years later. Brother Jeff, I may not have got saved. I might have thought, ah, see, that's how Christians are. I ain't going either. Daddy ain't going, I ain't going either. But Daddy didn't. Daddy stayed with it and kept on going. He didn't, he didn't jump ship in the storm. The storms are going to come. We just got to know what to do when we're in them. Let's stand this morning.